Hey everybody, Chris Brown here for another video for Murmur and Shockwave. I'm fortunate enough to be joined by Yusuf Ahmad, who's the director of Complex PCI at UCSF. And he's gonna show us a nice case of uh, lithotripsy and acute coronary syndrome today. Yusuf, thanks for joining us, man. Thanks for doing this. Thanks for having me, Chris. Looking forward to it. So I can jump in and show the case. Um, pretty typical awesome. you know, type of patient that you and I both deal with. 66 year old female, dialysis, vascular risk factors. She has an end STEMI at another hospital, kind of degenerates into cardiogenic shock. EF is 15%. She has a cath there that shows severe multivessel disease, RCA CTO, a lot of disease on the left side. They place a balloon pump. She's sort of intubated and ventilated, transferred over to our facility for sort of further evaluation. She is, of course, you know, turned down for bypass and advanced therapies. So then we're asked to take a look for PCI. Um, these are the images. The right, as I said, is total. You can see here, CERC has severe calcium, you know, multifocal disease in the CERC, very mm -hmm. tight proximally. LED has a gnarly aneurysm and a lot of calcium there, which I think, honestly, I, before I started the case, I probably underappreciated. I think when you have such a big aneurysm and other findings you can often kind of get a little distracted and i didn't appreciate just how calcified that was um i guess i'll ask you this is a pretty common um scenario where someone gets transferred on a balloon pump and you want to upgrade them to an impeller do you exchange out the balloon pump for the impeller on the same side or do you always get your own sort of new access for large ball yeah, I mean, I wish I had a perfect answer for this. What I do is I start, I give them some empiric antibiotics and then I use the same side. I take the balloon pump out and then have them clean that sheath and then I swap that sheath out. Um, and then I put a new sheath and I put a clean wire and then I deploy some per close. And I sort of try and make up this version of sterility that I created in my head, obviously without any real data. Sometimes I do really wonder if I should just switch sides. Um, you know, fortunately to date, and you know, as you mentioned, we end up with this scenario a good bit. Uh, it has gone well from an infection standpoint, hasn't caused any, any problems doing that. But I sometimes wonder about sticking the other side and, and doing that uh, just for sterility purposes, yeah. more or less. But you got to find a way to close the hole that you're working on anyway with that balloon pump. And so I think if you can keep it as sterile as possible, and I, I do think the prophylactic antibiotic or something we borrow from our surgeons. But we use uh, antibiotics in all of our percloses because once you've seen one infected perclose, you never want to see it again. Um, so we have sort of a, a weird deal there. Not everybody does that, um, but I, I think it, it probably helps. I mean, obviously I have no real data other than the empiric stuff, but I agree it's a really, it's a really good question. I also am like you though, where I see these aneurysms and I, there's always secretly calcium all over the place I, once you IVIS, but you look at it and you're like, oh, it's just a big aneurysm. We're going to find a way through that. And then I, you know, spend one hour getting through it, <laughs> trying to yeah. wire it because there's yeah, actually two secret <laughs> little tiny holes in a giant ball of tissue. Yeah. yeah, you'll see I had a, exactly that problem. Yeah, I, honestly, I've gone back and forth. There have been times, you know, I think that if you're, I, my default is to put a V18 or something up through the balloon pump side, take that out and then try and deploy per closes. I would say that, you know, you have to be comfortable with post closure because it's always a little hard to deploy the per closes after the balloon pump comes out. I normally, you know, try and put two in and hope that at least one of them takes. Um, and then, you know, but I've gone back and forth. There have been times that I've thought, you know, I'll just stick the other side. But I think if there's a groin shot available from, you know, the outside facility and it looks reasonable, then to try and save them another big arteriotomy, I think is sensible. So that's what we did for... Good point. That's a really important point you made there. I just want everybody to know that you're right. That groin shot from the outside hospital um, or the other facility, wherever they came from, is really critical to that decision making. And that's really smart. I like that a lot. So, yeah, for her, that's what we did in this case. We exchanged out the balloon pump, same size, uh, single access technique, and put a seven French guide in. This is just uh, another couple of pictures of um, the LED uh, area. We started working on the CERC first. You know, plan was obviously to leave the right for another day. Um, this was from before we had high definition IVUS, but you can see very, very severe calcium throughout in the CERC. And we tried to, you know, dilate this with pretty large non-compliant balloons and cutting balloons. Um, I do like, you know, in these calcified lesions, when I'm trying to use non-compliant balloons, I tend to take a longer one because then you can see really see the areas of under expansion. You could see here clearly under expanded pretty badly in a couple of spots. And 
elaborate on that a little for us? Because I think that's really a good technique. And I think people underappreciate that concept of how part of the balloon can be expanded and part can be underexpanded. And that actually gives you a sense of what's going on versus that alternative on that shorter balloon. Yeah, I think there's just the worry that if you take, if you're using a shorter balloon, which I understand some people want to do that to sort of exert the hydrostatic force, you know, in one spot, you know, when you pull back, you can have areas of geographic miss, and then you can think that you have dilated everything, everything looks expanded. Whereas if you take a not, you know, 30 millimeter balloon, A, you're going to get some information on deliverability, because being able to deliver a sort of a 3030 non-compliant balloon, if you can get that down, you're probably going to be able to get, you know, lift the tripsy and a stent down. And B, you can see areas very clearly when you have a long balloon, areas where the waste is and that you know that you haven't adequately modified that area. Um, yeah, I love it. This one I put in honestly for the fellows. I think that, you know, we're not taught very often um, the cost of different devices that we use. And I think some cases when you're trying, you know, a million different things, those are actually the cases that get very, very expensive. You know, if you're trying NC balloons and cutting balloons and scoring balloons, and then finally you decide to open lithotripsy, you know, you've suddenly racked up a big cost of that case. And I think that if you just upfront, you know, image, try and use the right tool for the right patient, you end up being more cost effective. And I think that one of the nice things with IVL now with the new codes, at least for the physician, if you are going to do like we do very commonly atherectomy and lithotripsy, um, you'll get those extra RVUs irrespective of what else you've done. But I think, you know, we often don't think about the cost of devices and this combination therapy when you're adding in, you know, rotor, cutting balloon, scoring balloon, you know, then IVL, those are when cases can get pretty expensive. And I think, you know, we don't, you know, often I didn't get taught it in fellowship at all. And, you know, I try and put this in, you know, for the fellows, just so they have some awareness of what different devices cost. Yeah, it's really important. I mean, you do have to make sure that your lab can afford to do the work or you can't actually help any patients. And, and as you mentioned, uh, not only is there a physician reimbursement that is that uniquely pays you for the rota and the lithotripsy, but also there's a hospital reimbursement for them separately as well, as far as increase in payment to the, the DRG, at least for inpatients. And that's really important too, to helping cover your cost of your cases, because in the end, we all have to run a, a financially responsible medical system the best that we can. Otherwise, we certainly won't be able to provide excellent care uh, to our patients. So completely agree. Great slide. So then we um, did lithotripsy, took a 3.5 IVL balloon and then had good expansion on that, re-imaged, saw fractures on the IVUS, and then put in two long, large drug eluting stents, post-dilated. Um, and then that's the final result in the circumflex. You know, we have all the distal branches covered all that critical disease. Luckily for her, you know, her left main was spared of significant disease. So we didn't have to get too involved in sort of bifurcation things and sort of indwelling ischemia. Uh, then we went on to um try and treat the LED. And then, you know, the first panel was just an embarrassingly long flora store of me trying to wire that aneurysm, which took, you know, an incredibly long time. Eventually we were able to find, you know, a path down with the cyan black um, and a microcatheter and then exchange that to a wiggle. And then honestly, to my surprise, it was really difficult just to deliver anything. And as I said, you know, I hadn't quite appreciated how calcified it was. Um, difficult to get in uh, two 5 NC balloons, 3 0 NC balloons, and every initial balloon was rupturing. Uh, so, obviously, really, really, really gnarly calcium there, which, as I said, often when I see the aneurysm, you know, my eye is just drawn to that, and then I don't appreciate um, the calcium and what we're dealing with. Um, these are bigger NC balloons, and you can see clearly, clearly underexpanded, you know, very severely around the aneurysm. Um, and again, it was hard to deliver stuff despite um, a guide extension, a wiggle wire, seven French guide. Um, we ended up going forwards with lithotripsy. Um, I'll say that this, you know, even despite having the impeller CP in, every single balloon inflation, you know, would tank her blood pressure. Um, I do try and pay attention to that. You know, I, even with the impeller in, I try and let um, the hemodynamics have as little, you know, um, injury to them as possible so if i get hypotension i you know deflate the balloons and then i wait a long time and i basically try and wait for that aortic pressure to get back to what it was and so i think you kind of have to treat it a little bit like you're doing atherectomy when you give really long breaks in between just really long 
perfusion time, allow the pressure to come back to normal again before you start treating. Um, this was in the era actually before C2 plus, um, so 80 pulses only. So we actually needed two balloons and I ended up using, you know, a 30 more distally and a 35 more proximally. Um, this was a case that I said, I get five pulses at a time when doing the lithotripsy, just because as soon as that pressure dropped, I would deflate and come down. And this was actually one of the only times that the uninflated shockwave balloon sat in the lesion was causing ischemia. So I had to pull the balloon back into the guide, allow perfusion, and then jam it back in, which, you know, these balloons don't rewrap. You know, the rewrap Very hard. hard. Yeah, so it was not the easiest to do. Um, and yeah, I had this is one of the only times that even deflating the balloon didn't allow resolution of that ischemia, and we had to kind of pull it back into the guide and re-advance it. Uh, after that, you know, we put in, um, again, two long, uh, largish stents, post-dilated, and then this was the final result that we had. Uh, we were very happy with that, good outflow, sort of all branches um, for both the circ and the LED were open. And she did well uh, in terms of, you know, clinical response. You know, we got the impeller out over the next couple of days, brought her back to the cath lab. Um, even though it had been pre-closed, that's still my sort of routine practice is to do all of this, you know, in the cath lab. Like you, I give those antibiotics. I normally remember halfway through when I'm looking down at what I'm doing, this is clearly not that sterile despite best efforts. And then we'll yeah. call to the nurses to give antibiotics. Yeah. Uh, she recovered, uh, ventricular function recovered. We brought her back later to do the right CTO um, and she had an excellent symptomatic response. I, I think that's a great case. I think that, you, I'll go back two slides so we can see that because that technical result is so good. I, I'd rather just sit on that slide for a minute than anything. Um, but I mean, that's so good. And as you you work through so many complex things, so I got we got questions that I got to ask you. The first is, you know, help us figure out or walk us through you think you're going to get through this aneurysm. I'm with you. I always think I'm getting through it too. Um, and then you're not, of course, because there's secretly calcium on both sides of that thing that you can't see angiographically. Um, so what are you doing? How do you decide on a microcatheter? How are you deciding on wires? What are you escalating to? Or what, what wires are we using to get through that? Yeah, I use my sort of my usual algorithm for sort of any type of challenging non-CTO lesion, whether it's, you know, very tight lesion, something with an aneurysm, or recrossing sort of jailed side branches. My default is I'll try my workhorse wire. I then um, will add a microcatheter to the workhorse wire. I then go to um, hydrophilic but non-jacketed wires like a regular Scion. And then I'll go to jacketed wires like a Scion Black. And I do that honestly just as a hierarchy of safety. Um, and so I only want to use, um, you know, more, you know, tools that have more predilection for complications like jacketed wires, more likely to dissect high gram tip wires, more likely to perforate. I only go to them when I really need it and I try and keep everything as safe as possible. So I'll start with a workhorse, then add the microcatheter, then go to the hydrophilic non-jacketed wire and then go to jacketed wires. I do find the Cyan Black really an outstanding wire for multiple, multiple purposes, um, this type of lesion and complexity. Uh, and then again, I really like it for recrossing um, jailed side branches. I think this is great. That's a great algorithm. That's exactly what I would do too. And I agree with you. I think it's a great for jailed. It's great for jailed side branches. It's great for recrossing it when you're doing a DK crush or a nano crush. It's great to get through things. It, it's just a, it is, it's a nice, it's a low gram tip load polymer jacketed wire that just kind of does nice things for you. And I, I love your sort of escalation of strategy based on escalation of kind of, you know, risk with the wire. I think that makes a great amount of sense. Um, um, can I ask you, Chris, would you have, um, you know, we had difficulty delivering, we had difficulty expanding, and we ended up working very hard not to do atherectomy. Um, yeah. Would you have done atherectomy in this case? It's funny. I was literally going to ask you that question. <laughs> Did you wish that you had done atherectomy in this case? I think that it's a, it's a really neat example, though, because as you mentioned, you didn't even barely have five seconds of ischemia before she crumped. And I don't know how many rotor runs I've done that were only five seconds long. I mean, I try and keep them at 10 seconds if I can, just to really decrease the amount of, you know, adenosine release and the no reflow and stuff. Um, but even then, I, you know, I'm frequently kind of drifting over that 10 second mark. I can't imagine a five second rotor run would have gotten through this, um, 
without doing about a million of them. And that burr itself might have been ischemic, frankly, just sitting there, just the way that you were having with the with the lithotripsy. So I think that's a really tough question. I think this is a good example of how with the right kind of tools, a wiggle wire, a guide extension, you can do calcium modification and you don't necessarily have to use um, atherectomy. While it may have made things a little bit faster for delivery of stuff um, after the calcium had been modified, it certainly could have complicated your life with regard to the hemodynamics because the you just the balloon did. So I don't know that anybody has the perfect or the right answer, but I, I think this is a nice example of how you don't necessarily have to do it, especially if the hemodynamics are going to give you a lot of grief. Um, so yeah, she was. I think you know this patient was tenuous. Um, IVL can cause hemodynamic disturbance, but only really through balloon occlusion. That's the only way it can do it. And if you exactly. deflate the balloon and then if you really need to get it out the way, they should recover. But I think, you know, if we had done atherectomy and, you know, God forbid, had no reflow, even with the impeller in, that may have been a, you know, a CPR yeah. situation. I, I completely agree. I think this is just a, an awesome example of, of use of all the tools in the toolbox, all the skills in the toolbox, and just a, a great result for this patient who now is essentially, you know, back to normal from a uh, beginning a presentation of somewhat dire consequence. So a really nice case. Thank you so much for sharing this with us. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you very much.